So we're going we're gonna to talk today about complex regional pain syndrome. I'm Norman Harden. Uh, I'm the uh, director of the Center for Pain Studies at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. Uh, that means I'm uh, a professor at the uh, Northwestern University. Uh, and I'm going to talk about sort of the, the basics, uh, the 101 course, but I guess because this is a master's course, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the 102. Uh, and then after me, uh, uh, my colleague who has been giving this course for, for a while is going gonna, is gonna to do the fun stuff. He's going to do some case-based uh, uh, type approach where he talks about difficult cases. Um, so, well, let's just jump right into it. Um, if I can get this to work. So here's my disclosures. Uh, relevant to this, the only thing is that I have had and... Uh, my team currently do have grant support from the Reflex Sympathetic Dystrophy Association. I, I do not personally have grant support from them at this time. All right. <clears throat> well, what we're talking about today is pain in the autonomic nervous system. Um, this is important that we remember this because we all get bogged down in these diagnostic criteria and how do you, how, who derives what and who uses what and who's codified what. But, but you go all the way back uh, historically, like to Silas Weir Mitchell, uh, who uh, was a Union surgeon. Uh, and in spite of the fact that he was actually working for the wrong side of that, uh, that little uh, uh, battle, he, uh, you know, he said, oh my goodness, these people, they have these horrible autonomic uh, disturbances with pain. Uh, and, and we need to remember that is what really characterizes this. Uh, that's the one, the one diagnostic pearl that if you see somebody with uh, a profound vasomotor or pseudomotor abnormalities and pain, you're pretty much definitely in the ballpark. Uh, my young assistant here is reminding me this is the fight or flight nervous system. Usually the nervous system involved in, you know, getting us to run away, get out of dodge. But of course you can't run away uh, from a, a, a limb uh, affected by complex regional pain syndrome or as some people still call it, uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. All right, I'm going to talk today uh, a bunch about mechanisms and there's a reason for that. Uh, I believe that an understanding of mechanisms uh, is critical uh, for a researcher such as myself, but I also do some clinical work still and uh, and I believe that it is critical to get the best appreciation you can of mechanisms of disease, i.e. diagnosis, before you proceed to treat. It doesn't make any sense unless you have an idea which of your treatments are going to work and why. But the reason this is, this is, this is a complicated issue in CRPS is that it's multifactorial in nature and it changes over time. Some mechanisms you see early on, such as inflammation, may not even, even be present uh, in the chronic phases when you'll really see more like central sensitization. So it's important to have kind of a, a perspective of the type of mechanisms that can be involved uh, and then to uh, appreciate the fact that they will change over time as the uh, disease progresses. Uh, one of the first things that our, our patients tell us empirically uh, is that there's sensory changes, you know, pain. Uh, obviously, I, I get sent patients where, you know, they have autonomic disturbances and no pain, and they say, is this CRPS? And I say, no, it's not complex regional pain syndrome. So the sensory phenomena are, are essential to the diagnosis, and I think essential to the understanding of the mechanism. Now, what we see is uh, uh, phenomena that are evoked in the environment. These can either be evoked by uh, things that happen to patients during the day. They'll tell you that uh, taking a, a shower, the hot water, makes it sting like a sunburn, uh, or um, air conditioning blowing on the affected part really, really sends them up the wall. And this is called allodynia. These are innocuous stimuli that are now painful. Um, this is contrasted with the other type of evoked pain that, that, that not only our patients will tell us, they stub a toe and it hurts for days, uh, but we can elicit at the bedside, uh, such as sticking a pin in people. Uh, and this is called hyperpathia. Now, uh, I left this slide as it was, but uh, the um, International Association for the Study of Pain has obliterated uh, uh, the concept of hyperalgesia, hyperesthesia. They no longer allow this terminology. 
But I thought I'd put it up there just so you know that in older literature you're going to see this but really now we want to focus on innocuous stimuli that is now painful, or allodynia, and hyperpathia, which is mildly painful stimulus that is now extremely painful and it lasts a long time, or as we call it, after sensation. And what does this tell us about mechanisms? Well, certainly changes cutaneously, <clears throat> and although this is a nice picture of skin here, uh, this could also be a joint or a muscle. Uh, and, and what we see, of course, is uh, uh, the, the inflammatory response, or sometimes you'll hear the nociceptive response that can occur in these tissues. Um, this is non-nervous tissue, by definition, uh, and these changes uh, are primarily mediated, we think now, by cytokine. Uh, cytokine is kind of this mystical incantation that we explain everything in pain this week. Very trendy stuff. Uh, but it may actually be true in this case uh, because, the, you know, this whole family uh, of inflammatory mediators or pain mediators uh, uh, are certainly, every time we look, everywhere we look in the nervous system, we see abnormalities in CRPS patients and in many other pain uh, disorders as well. Um, we also see uh, neuropathic changes, uh, and these would be changes to nerves such as a dropout of small fibers. A year and a half ago, uh, there was a school that thought that this was the answer. This is what happens in CRPS. These small fibers drop out, or you get a small fiber neuropathy, and that drives everything else that, that, uh, that is involved in the, in the disease. Uh, in fact, I believe that the small fibers drop out as a epiphenomena to something else that happens, which is va intense vasoconstriction, and ischemia. I think this is just nutritional. These cells are dying back. And they probably contribute to the pain uh, in the neuropathic sense. But, but there's, no, uh, there's no assurance uh, that that's the, that's the case either. So neuropathic pain is, uh, is clearly involved in, in most CRPS. Uh, uh, the interesting distinction is CRPS type 1 implies that there's no, ma quote, major nerve disorder. And it's not better defined. To, to go and do an EMG or something like that on a CRPS patient, they'll never come back. They're going to be very, very upset with you, and they'll never come back to your clinic. So you have to make major nerve disorder based on just general history and physical uh, precepts. But we think that small nerves are involved even in CRPS type 1. And then when you have a clear large nerve disorder, uh, like a transected nerve or a crushed nerve, uh, uh, then you call it CRPS type 2. But neuropathy, uh, in, in my opinion, is involved in pretty much all CRPS. Small fibers, CRPS type 1. Large fibers, CRPS type 2. Nerve conduction causes too much pain, is that what you mean? That's correct. That's correct. Um, the the uh, electrical stimulus uh, of, uh, of nerve conduction uh, and even more uh, torturous, the, the, the EMG, uh, which in some cases is the best way to look for, um, uh, for neuropathic changes, as you know. But it's excruciating for these patients, and, I, and the first three I did it on convinced me I'd never do it again. All right, where am I? <clears throat> uh, we see changes uh, and presumed changes in the central nervous system, starting with the, um, uh, with the um, uh, tetrapartite synapse. This is the old first synapse coming into the spinal cord and, the dorsal, and, and, and synapsing in the dorsal horn with the second order transmission cell. And we used to think this was a nice straightforward uh, 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 relationship involving, uh, actually we first thought, substance P, substance pain. Uh, and we believed that that was the only thing that was going on back in those days and then we found out, oh, there was excitatory amino acids, glutamate, we started looking at for NMDA receptors on this uh, second uh, neuron, uh, but it was still neurochemical uh, and electrochemical in nature here. But what we know now that that really is probably only about 10% of what's going on in terms of communication and whether or not the message gets across the synapse. It seems to be regulated very clearly and very distinctly by uh, astrocytes and microglia, you know, 
glia, the glue that holds the brain together. And we literally used to think it was like just a, a, an exoskeleton that held the brain together, but now we know it is remarkably and dynamically um, uh, active uh, and, and involved in not only changes uh, at these receptors here that we began to call central sensitization or augmentation, uh, but whether or not the message actually even gets across the synapse. So again, I'm invoking this mystical incantation of cytokine here. The glia uh, certainly uh, mediate their message uh, and their actions by cytokine. And uh, we, we've got a lot of evidence that, that there are changes, not only in CRPS patients, but in other pain disorders that are regional or one-sided. You'll see changes side to side in terms of glial cell density, glial cell plumpness, if you will, because you know, they swell up and get active and shrink down and, and become inactive. Uh, uh, <clears throat> But, uh, but, but they are, uh, their reaction, their uh, elaboration of cytokine um, uh, is also different side to side. And importantly, because the sympathetic nervous system has long been uh, 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 invoked uh, to be a, an essential part of, uh, of this disorder, you will see the vasomotor changes. Uh, and of course, the, the patients will tell you, you know, it changes color or it gets hot or it gets cold. And it usually is hot early on and gets cooler as time passes. Looks like sympathetic um, hypofunction at first, which goes back to my statement that small fiber neuropathy is probably always the case. Uh, but then as time passes, not only in the animal models, but in humans, you see uh, uh, an apparent sympathetic hyperfunction. And we think that hyperfunction, because we'll give people injections, uh, sympathetic injections, the limb warms up and the pain gets better. So for years, everybody said, well, that's it. That's the definition. That, that's not only diagnostic, uh, but that confirms that it's sympathetic hyperactivity. Well, I did an experiment when I was, when I was pretty young. Um, we, we did beer blocks, which means not, you know, drink a six pack of beer. <laughs> But you put a, an IV in the affected part, which is also excruciating, and they didn't like that. We used uh, propofol. Anybody ever heard of propofol? Uh, we called it witch's milk, but, it, but we would put it so, it so we could put it in the affected part. But, but for infusing bretillium or the sympatholytic agent, you have to have a rescue IV. So we just slipped a rescue IV in the unaffected side let them sit around for a while and drew out blood and checked it for catecholamines. And to make a long story short, rather than showing increased catecholamine levels on the affected side, we showed decreased catecholamine levels, which implies to us that it probably is receptor upregulation on the vessels and perhaps on the, on the pain nerves uh, uh, that, we're, that we're seeing rather than sympathetic hyperactivity. Make sense? And now the blocks just helped a little bit and it spilled over onto the somatic nervous system. Uh, but, but clearly this, this is not specifically indicative of the fact that it's sympathetic hyperactivity. It could well be changes in the periphery. And that's gonna be a theme of my, uh, of my uh, theory or hypothesis of how this works is that you know, it's an interaction between the periphery and the central, central nervous system which talks back to the periphery on the sympathetic side. You see trophic changes, um, sometimes very extreme changes. And this, this is where people come into your office and you go, oh my God, what in the world am I gonna do? What is this? Uh, the, you know, this guy who had cellulitis and uh, just an awful horror show. I think this patient actually came from Dr. Schwartzman. I believe this was one of his, uh, one of his cases. Um, and so what's going on with this? Well, you know, there's receptors on all the different cells. You can have dystrophic changes of skin, nails, hair. You can have osteopenia of bone, or as we call it, sudex atrophy. Uh, and we see uh, receptors of these, of these cytokines and other inflammatory mediators on all of these tissues. Uh, and again, this may, these, uh, these uh, subtle neurochemicals uh, maybe what's mediating these changes or this dystrophic changes. 
we now have the ability and the technology to look at the central nervous system and the function of, some, uh, of the central nervous system. There's not been a lot of work done, but we have done some work with the fMRI uh, at, at Northwestern, uh, and we've uh, elicited, oops, uh, we've, we've begun to understand what areas of the brain are involved, but we're also looking at, uh, at, at the DTI, which measures the, the communication between these different areas and how active the tracks are, uh, and we're getting a signature of CRPS. The interesting thing is we predicted it would be very similar to uh, other diseases, other regional diseases, uh, but in fact it is different. It looks different, uh, and Dr. Apkarian, uh, who's the um, physicist genius I work with, is convinced that he can look at a scan and tell you what the patient's diagnosis is, specifically CRPS. And, and one of the things that, that is, is a sort of new thing is the motor disturbances that go along with this disease. But we have to explain this with a mechanistic hap hypothesis. And you see, you know, the, the routine stuff, the weakness, the decreased range of motion, uh, you know, there's motivational aspects to all of that. But you also see some rather dramatic motor uh, dysfunction, such as dystonia. And you'll see patients that are all knotted up like this. And, uh, again, back when I thought I was an anesthesiologist in the early days, I'd do a, a sympathetic block and the pain would go away and the dystonia would go away and the lidocaine would, 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 would tend to uh, uh, go away, uh, break down, and the dystonia would come back. So there are sympathetically mediated or sympathetically maintained phenomena in terms of dystonia. Uh, but that's not the only, the only thing, because clearly as the disease becomes more chronic, the blocks no longer work. So the motor changes that we see and must explain in our, in our uh, 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 mechanistic uh, hypothesis, weakness, of course, dystonia. You can see all kinds of tremors and, and jerking, myoclonic jerking. Uh, and then, of course, you get into secondary problems when a person has been locked up into dystonia, for years, you'll do a block and nothing happens. Is that due to the fact that the block doesn't work, it's not sympathetically maintained pain, or is it contracture? And it simply can't relax. And we, we do funky things like we do uh, uh, halothane anesthesia to see exactly what we can do, manipulation under anesthesia to help us understand uh, these phenomena. And we can measure these things. This, this is the good news about CRPS, is we're developing techniques so that we don't have to rely on subjective pain report exclusively. We're in the pain business. We have to rely on that primarily. But now we're beginning to develop uh, technologies where we can look at, uh, for instance, psychometric, uh, uh, te I'm sorry, psychophysical testing, which is quasi-objective, and the biometric tests like the fMRI, which is fully objective. So we're beginning to complement this subjective report of pain uh, and this is, uh, this is a, um, uh, I would say, quasi-objective methodology for measuring bradykinesia that these patients sometimes have. Where's the picture? Uh, well, sometimes you can get massive swelling and edema uh, uh, with, uh, with this disease. <coughs> and you'll notice as I go along, I keep saying disease, disease, disease. Now, uh, I, I, I think of this as a disease. It's, it's a coherent concept that I see over and over again. You know, it has slightly different manifestations. Uh, but, you know, technically I'm supposed to call it a syndrome because it's a collection of signs and symptoms. I simply think that it is a distinct entity, which, in my mind, allows me to call it disease. But if you want to yell at me, it's formally a syndrome. So. Sympathetically maintained pain. What is this? Pain that is caused, mediated, or maintained by activity of the sympathetic nervous system. It can be either hyperactivity of the, of the SNS efferents or receptor upregulation. I've already talked about this. Uh, but, but it used to be that, that doctors would give a sympathetic block, and if patients responded, they had RSD. This is before we called it CRPS. 
And if they didn't respond to a sympathetic block, you had to go back to the, to the drawing board. And then we, we knew that that wasn't the case because people that responded lost that response over time. They started to talk about sympathetically independent pain. But when you hear this in the literature, or you hear this from your uh, anesthesiological colleagues, uh, it, it really is only relevant in terms of treatment. Because if somebody does have a good response to a sympathetic block and they have a, a period of pain-free, relatively good motion, uh, to me, as a rehabilitationist, this is brilliant. This is a window of opportunity so that I can do my physical therapy, occupational therapy, you know, focus on biofeedback, go to cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. These things can be accomplished now in a relative pain-free state. So a window of opportunity provided by sympathetic blocks, and that's really the only relevance now of doing those blocks, is to see if it, if it can help. How does the sympathetic nervous system impact these tissues in the periphery? Well, I've already told you the answer to this, of course. Its sympathetic nervous system is not just about norepinephrine anymore. We know that the sympathetic nervous system brings a huge cohort of these cytokine type drugs, these inflammatory mediators, if you will. And they, of course, will cause changes not only in the pain receptors themselves and the nerves themselves, but probably in all the tissues out there, the vessels, the muscles, uh, and of course the bone. How do we measure these cytokines? Well, we've got these pretty gross methodologies that seem to be quite effective, particularly if you have a kind of a cutaneous looking variant of CRPS. Uh, what you can do is you put this, uh, this uh, suction cup on here. It's got these little holes in it, and it sucks up these blisters, and then you just sample the blisters, and you send them off. And Of course, you'll, uh, the, one of the good things about most cases of CRPS is that you, it, you have an affected side and an unaffected side, so you have a comparator. Now, you know, we, I probably won't get into this day, maybe Philip will, but, but a, a discussion of, you know, whether or not CRPS spreads. I, I'm not a big fan of spreading CRPS. Uh, I think I've seen it, I think I've seen it really three times in my 25-year career of treating it. I have to change that because I think I saw a fourth case last Tuesday. But I think it rarely spreads, all right? So usually you have the ability com to compare the side to side. Now somebody was laughing out there when I said that I don't believe in spreading CRPS, and I'll go ahead and say it. I, I get people sent to me all the time, they've got whole body CRPS, okay? And I have to let the you know, residents go in the room before me because I, you know, I need to go take Valium or whatever it is that I need to calm me down. But, 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 the, but the point is, in every single case of spreading CRPS that I have examined, what I see is the original limb, the single limb that may or may not still have symptoms that I can detect, and symptoms that are identical to fibromyalgia in the rest of the body. Okay? So you've got this regional sensitization syndrome driving the central nervous system, which now has general uh, sensitization, which we call fibromyalgia, okay? Or in the case of opioids, opioid-induced hyperalgesia. But these are general, general phenomena, but it is not spreading CRPS. It is a secondary phenomena to the, to the CRPS, in my, opi my humble opinion. All right, uh, and then you can, of course, measure uh, different cytokines in the blisters, and we see big differences between the non-involved and uh, involved signs. The, these, are, uh, these data are mostly out of um, uh, Holland. And it's interesting, you know, the Dutch are all about inflammation as the cause of CRPS. Uh, in Chicago, we're all about central sensitization, you know, with our, our bent towards fMRI. Um, uh, other, uh, other schools, like the German, uh, the German uh, schools, are all about sympathetic activity. And these labs have compelling evidence that this is the answer. This is what's going on. Uh, but it, it all happens to all the patients. And it's necessary to bust out of so, some sort of regional concept of, of how it works and try to develop systems that explain it all, that include it all. Uh, and here's my hypothesis. All right, 
So CRPS uh, is maintained and reinforced by nested po positive feed forward and feedback loops. All right? And the feed forward starts usually in the periphery with pain and inflammation. Uh, you can have changes uh, at the, uh, along the nervous system, along the neuroaxis, where you can form ephapsis with the efferent side or the, uh, the outgoing part, where you, it, you can see that you can get an immediate link up here uh, between the pain and inflammation changes in ephapsis uh, at the nerve that feeds back, efferent back, cytokine back to cause more pain and inflammation. causes a vicious circle. Go up a little bit into the ganglia uh, and into the dorsal horn, which is right next to the lateral horn, which of course is the sympathetic outflow. And you can start to uh, conceive many different vicious cycles. And that's why I say these are nested loops. They, they feed back on one another. They start here, and then maybe the loop is really maintained here. And sometimes I believe in patients, really the loop is maintained up in the central nervous system or the spinal cord, and now no longer involves the signs and symptoms that you would normally use to make the diagnosis. So it's difficult. But this is the hypothesis that allows us to say, yes, the Dutch are right. Yes, the Germans are right. Yes, even those guys in Chicago are right. And that, you know, if, if you look at this, you'll see this acutely. If you look at this, You'll see this chronically, and that really is, is exactly how it boils out in terms of the referral bias of those two groups. Uh, and then, of course, our, our German colleagues are all about the efferent side in the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, but this, this is uh, uh, unifying, I think. This is what we were looking at in our political conventions. We want unification and people talking and coming together, right? This is what we're doing with all the labs around the world, right? If you believe that, I have, I have a Swiss watch I'd like to sell you. But, you know, science marches on. We're having some fun. Here's the red herring that superimposes over all of this. We don't really understand this at all. I mean, there's people that talk like they understand this, uh, but I don't believe it. But genetics and the corollary of that in terms of treatment, the pharmacogenetics, it is, I mean, the whole enchilada as far as I can tell. But uh, ask me back next year. Maybe we'll have more information. We can talk about genetics more. How's, how am I doing for time? So chronic pain is a biopsychosocial disease. Now, I admit it. I'm a dyed-in-the-wool rehabilitationist, you know, trained as a neurologist, then trained by anesthesiologists, spent a lot of time uh, in the psychiatry department, et cetera. Uh, but once I got out and started practicing pain medicine, rehab is it. Rehab is the only thing that really works, okay? And the reason it works is because it doesn't obsess on one little piece of the, of the hypothesis, one piece of the puzzle. It embraces the whole person. In other words, it is holistic in concept. And you don't know whether the blocks are going to be the key or the drugs are going to be the key or the cognitive behavioral psychotherapy is going to be the key, or some combination is going to be the key. But if you're, if you're unable to embrace this biopsychosocial nature of the disease, please get out of this business and go into radiology. Because if you ignore, if you ignore psychology, you will fail. You can't treat chronic pain of any kind if you ignore the psychology. Don't, don't bother. And if you ignore the sociology, you're going to get your head handed to you. You're not going to understand why people are not getting better or you're not able to help. And that's just because there's other issues that need to be addressed. Okay. Psychological aspects. And, you know, this is, this is very understandable stuff. My mentor in the field of CRPS is Gary Bennett, who's a basic scientist. And I used to go work with him at NIH. My rat karma is awful. But... You know, he said, look, these people tell me that if you, if you put your hand in a, in a pot of boiling water and you just left it there 24-7, what do you think that's going to do to your mood? You know? <laughs> so that's, you know, pretty compelling argument that, yeah, you know, it's not going to make them happy. It's not going to improve their sleep. It's certainly not going to, you know, help their quality of life. So, 
you know, they get into these anxiety syndromes, anxiety and fear, uh, a lot of anger, you know, and the stages of, uh, of death and dying are pretty much uh, salient for uh, CRPS as well because, you know, they're, they're angry, you know. Why me? What the heck? Suffering depression, failure to cope. You can send people to the moon. How come you can't cure me? You know, that, that sort of stuff. You may not be able to mediate that, but you certainly can listen and you certainly can structure uh, a situation where a, a patient feels okay saying, wow, I'm just worn out and this is really, really bringing me down. You know, and say, yeah, I understand that. Let's work on that too, okay? And if you do, you'll help your patients a lot. What I always say is, you know, CRPS is hard to treat. Depression is very easy to treat. You know, we have brilliant antidepressant drugs with low side effect profile now. Uh, and we have cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, which is, which is hugely effective in the treatment of depression. So you, if you have something in a patient, if a patient comes in and they are depressed, embrace that. This is brilliant. This is a brilliant opportunity to treat. All right, I think I've belabored that enough, right? But there, are, there, are, there is a lot of literature about the associated uh, uh, psychological ramifications of CRPS. And, I, and I'll put it in a, a nutshell for you. It's depression and anxiety in terms of DSM-4 diagnoses. Uh, and again, these things are relatively easy to treat uh, as opposed to the biomedical manifestations of the disease. And, you know, again, it's not just, uh, it's not just psychometrics because now we're beginning to find that the biometric, fully objective correlations of anxiety. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, this is uh, anxiety and CRPS. So we can measure anxiety now as a correlate to talking to our patients and doing the psychometrics. And the sociologic factors, um, you know, they're, they're really, really pervasive in CRPS because it is such a horrible disease and it's often the result of trauma. Uh, but again, as physicians and, and practitioners, we can have a, a huge benefit in this regard because we can clarify issues. We can write out, you know, disability statements and modifications and restrictions and, you know, all of these things are, are really uh, in our, uh, in, on our plate if we'll accept them. And we can help our patients a lot by embracing these issues rather than trying to sweep them under the rug. Return to work. <laughs> all right. Now, now, well, this, well, all the, all the treatment al algorithms for um, uh, CRPS are based on functional restoration, okay? And the ultimate functional restoration, of course, is return to work. That's why I put that up there. Diagnosis, how do we make a diagnosis? Somebody's trying to read this. The metallic grinding means her throw out bearings are shot. She's back firing through the carburetor. The tick indicates transmission trouble and the smoke means she's on fire. You know, this is your good clinician, you know. I know Philip, I don't, I don't wanna steal his thunder, but you know, you, this is the disease where you really have to look at people and talk to them and do that incredibly radical thing of touching them. You know? I, I know this is radical in the HMO world and... <laughs> All right. Diagnostic criteria, there's an old, this is the old one, this is the one that everybody's used for the past 10 years. I knew that was gonna happen. Um, how much time do I have left? We're good? Okay. Uh, that wasn't you calling me, telling me to get off the stage. Uh, <clears throat> this, this is, this, you know, th this was good, but before this, it was total diagnostic chaos. Was it something I said? <laughs> um, it, was, it was total diagnostic chaos before we had this. Everybody just, you know, you, you had doctors saying, oh, I know this, I've treated this, I know it when I see it. I don't need no stinking criteria. Uh, I've actually had one of my colleagues say that recently on, on, in court, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, in 1994, and five, and six. In the lake. Um, 
they, um, they had meetings, a series of meetings where they, try, they, they, they tried to clean this up. They not only cleaned up the diagnostic criteria and came up with this, but when they did this, they wanted a general, broad criteria that everybody, everybody got in. Nobody was left out. A big net. So it was meant to be very, very sensitive. And they didn't even discuss specificity. They said, ah, we'll get back to that, to that later when we understand the mechanisms better, okay? Uh, but there were problems with this. Uh, this is the old IASP criteria, by the way. Uh, but there were problems with this, which is that the that, that patient, you know, you'd ask the patient, has, has it ever uh, changed color? And they say, yeah, well, it was a little red when it first started, but there's been no color changes since. Well, on the basis of that criteria, you would say, oh, okay, you check that off. That's uh, criterion, what is it, three. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a problem with that because almost any disease initially is going to have, you know, a little color change, a little swelling. So uh, we, th we thought that we could do better than this. And we knew that we could use statistically derived schemes and, and, and empirical schemes uh, to uh, uh, derive a criteria that was based on, on uh, the empirical knowledge. In other words, our patients informed the, 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 the der derivation of the criteria. So we had a standardized symptom sign-in checklist, uh, 123 patients. We published external validation, internal validation. This is actually both here, 1999. Uh, and we, we saw that there were specific, four specific factors that came out of this. Uh, one was pain, one was vasomotor disturbance, one was uh, pseudomotor disturbance and edema, and one was motor, uh, and for some reason, statistically, the, the dystonic changes, uh, dystrophic changes uh, locked up with that. And because of, because of these statistics, you can set the sensitivity and the specificity. So now remember, the IASP criteria is very, very sensitive. In other words, it was essentially 100% sensitive in terms of it didn't miss a diagnosis. Uh, but it was 0.4 uh, 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 specificity, which is horrible. That means that you have a less, you'd have more chance of diagnosing the disease properly by flipping a coin than using the old IASP criteria. So we thought we would set a criteria uh, that had higher specificity. And we did. This is now called the Budapest criteria. Uh, we revalidated this in 2010, if you want to pull that in the journal Pain. Uh, but uh, there's two. There's actually a research criteria. And what, it, what the research criteria it requires four symptoms and two sign factors, okay? In other words, uh, symptoms, uh, one, a symptom in all four of these factors and a sign in, in two of these, any two of these. And that delivers a sensitivity of 0.7 which is not bad, and a specificity of 0.94. There's nothing like it in medicine. So it's a brilliant, uh, a brilliant specificity. You're going to make sure you get people that really have the disease, if you will, in your research paradigm. So we thought that was important for research. But here was a problem, 0.7. That means that 30% of the people who had a diagnosis of CRPS now don't have a diagnosis. Big problem. So we were prevailed upon by the patient advocacy groups to have a clinical diagnostic criteria. The only difference is three symptoms rather than four. Still two signs, and this delivers a sensitivity of 0.85 and a specificity of 0.69, which is not too shabby. Uh, and this has been accepted by the IASP. Uh, in other words, it's the new IASP criteria, but you'll often hear it called the, the Budapest criteria. All right, treatment. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go very quickly through this because Philip's gonna uh, spend more time with this. But, but I'll start with the fact that there's very, very, very few randomized controlled trials uh, in CRPS. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the first is it's less than five million uh, people in the country that have it. And five million is the threshold to catch the, the pharmaceutical industry's attention. 
Okay, we're, we're trying to get an orphan drug status for it, which is, provides some advantages to the pharmaceutical industry, and hopefully if we can open that up, uh, I'm sorry, orphan disease status, not orphan drug status. But, but if we can open that up, hopefully we'll start to get some, um, some treatments for our patient. And there's a lot of reasons that, uh, beyond the economics uh, that we don't have uh, uh, good treatments for our patients, haven't developed a good evidence base, but, you know, there's randomization ethics. Are you going to deny somebody with this horrible, horrible, horrible disease uh, a, a treatment for, you know, six months w w w when they're on control? Uh, how do you blind anybody? I mean, you can see it. It's, it's right there. Um, you know, the economics. Uh, you know, i got a pain clinic. I have to pay the bills. Am I going to take people out of, out of that, that consideration to do research? Referral bias, you know. Uh, I, I get, uh, I'm, I spend a lot of time studying psych psychiatry and I treat a lot of people with psychiatric uh, disturbance as a, as a secondary phenomenon. Uh, but that doesn't have anything to do with what the Dutch are treating, the, you know, the hyperinflammatory acute cases. Totally different. Look, totally different, but we think it's the same disease. What outcomes do you use? This is an interesting, um, uh, you know, this is an interesting phenomenon in pain medicine. We're all doing Evidence-based guidelines, systematic reviews, you know. So they do these things with, for, for CRPS, and there's only five things that survived the cut, and it was a loose cut. Well, that's okay. It's odd stuff. Uh, calcitonin, salmon calcitonin. Pff, the best randomized control trials are with salmon calcitonin. Who knows? I mean, nobody uses it in treatment, but there you go. Bisphosphonates have a lot of promise. IV uh, catanserin. What the heck? You can't get that in, in the United States, I'll tell you. It's a, it's a serotonin active agent. PT, but only for coping skills. Not physical therapy for pain or getting on with your life stuff, but just coping outcomes. And then there was level three evidence, which gets kicked. Now, this is well and good. You know, this, this, it's great when you're trying to make a case to, to say something like the NIH that we really need more research and we need to develop better uh, evidence base. But what happens is the insurance industry comes in and says, well, we've got a systematic review now. This is all we're going to pay for. I'll leave you with that thought for a minute. But what does work? Well, we know this. This, this, this. this is empirical. Sorry about that. But until we get something better, we still want to identify treatments. You know, obviously, we try to pay attention to the risk-benefit ratio and get treatments that are not going to do our patients harm if we can. And then we step up the line and, and do more and more invasive treatments as, uh, as time goes on and they don't get better. Starts with psychology. Uh, our, our RNs, our patient educators, MDs, DOs, occupational therapy is a critical, critical concept in the treatment of CRPS. If you believe that functional restoration needs to be the pivot of everything that you do, um, uh, and of course PT, recreational therapy, sometimes the only way I can get my patients moving is to give them back something the disease has taken away, social work and vocational rehab. Uh, are the team. All right, and, and there's, um, you know, there's a lot of literature out there now about different treatment algorithms. This is the first, uh, and I think probably the best, uh, but this is functional restoration. It starts with gentle stuff, and then you take the next step, and then you go into uh, where you're starting to do stress loading, which is, is, is a critical treatment. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that. But notice you all get all the way back down to vocational and functional rehabilitation as the ultimate expression uh, of, uh, of functional restoration. We, we like our, our city names as the Malibu algorithm because they locked us all in a room in Malibu until we came up with a treatment algorithm. There, were two there was one physiatrist in me, a neurologist who, who is a physiatry wannabe, and a bunch of anesthesiologists. Uh, in this uh, nice hotel in Malibu, and we're into the third day, and we had made no progress, you know, all the egos and everything. Well, I pulled Angela Malice, the physiatrist, aside, and I said, stay sober.
because this is the last night, and everybody was slamming the, the wine. And, uh, and so we got up the next morning, and everybody else was so hungover, just <laughs> dead hat hungover. And they're like, Harden, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. So, I mean, there may be a lot of bias uh, in, in this functional <laughs> restoration here. <laughs> the, power, the, power of, uh, the power of alcohol. I'm, I'm a Celt. I really know the power of alcohol. It's kept us Irish down. For... All right. Physical therapy and occupational therapy, there's a good evidence base for this. It did not survive well in the uh, systematic review that Roberto Perez did. Uh, but, but I think that the evidence base is as good for physical therapy and occupational therapy as anything else in CRPS. Uh, physical therapy, of course, is reactivation and never underestimate aerobic conditioning for whole body feeling better, sleeping better, uh, improved blood, uh, blood flow. Uh, De-emphasizing high-tech passive modalities, emphasizing low-tech, things that patients can do. And most importantly, reanimation of the affected part. Stretching, strengthening, desensitization is, is very important in, in CRPS because uh, these patients, when they come see me, they won't let me touch the affected part. So desensitization is, is pretty critical to that concept of getting on with your life. And mirror therapy, this is something new, but it's very effective. I'm, I'm quite Im impressed with this, but we don't have a good uh, evidence base for this at this point. Uh, the, um, the, uh, there's an English group that's working on that and they're getting ready to publish some really strong stuff about mirror. Uh, occupational therapy, this scrub loading where you load the joint and you actually use a scrub brush so it vibrates, so it's desensitizing and loading the joint seems to be absolutely critical and probably the most effective therapy of all. Not a great evidence base. Uh, voc rehab, I don't need to tell you guys about all of this, but uh, trying to help people get on with their lives. Um, psychosocial um, targets, uh, I think targets that we should embrace. Uh, and then we use cognitive behavioral techniques. That's what works. That's about the only thing that works. Psychodynamics is fun, but it doesn't really help my, my chronic pain patients to get on. Stress management, coping skills, relaxation, imagery, self-hypnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and very importantly, bi biofeedback. Because autogenic biofeedback, of course, you can teach people how to do limb, limb warming, which means suppressing the sympathetic nervous system to the affected part. Mirror therapy, I'm not going to go into this. Pharmacotherapy, uh, I'm not going to go into this too much because remember what I said, there's no real randomized controlled trials. We're always extrapolating from other diseases. But if you see somebody with mild to moderate pain, you use simple analgesics. Excruciating and tractable pain, you may use stronger uh, medications like opioids. Inflammation, anti-inflammatories like steroids or, or non-steroidals. Depression, anxiety, insomnia, obviously the sedative, analgesic, anti antidepressants, and anxiolytics, um, significant allodynia, anticonvulsants, and sodium channel blockers, uh, significant osteopenia or dystrophic changes. You may use that salmon calcitonin. That's a good rationale for that. And profound vasomotor disturbance, you may use blocks, uh, and of course, things like calcium channel blockers. Uh, how am I doing for time, Philip? Okay. Uh, I want to just engage in a little controversy here. Um, opioids, NCRPS. Now, I hope I've convinced you that this is a disease that probably starts with peripheral sensitization and inflammation, and then it causes sensitization of the central nervous system. We have a class of drugs that is analgesic, but may cause sensitization or as we call it, opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So there's, there's a problem using prolonged, chronic, high-dose opioid in a disease that is characterized by sensitization, central sensitization. So if you believe the concept of opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and I know Dr. Pasek is going to give a probably very amusing talk about opioid-induced hyperalgesia, I think, tomorrow. 
But if you, if you believe in this concept, you know, certainly we've proven it beyond a shadow of doubt in rats, but, you know, rats are not men. Uh, if you want to read up on this, uh, Jiren Mao is the one that, that started the ball rolling, but there's a lot of publications. Uh, I noticed Lynn Webster wandering around. He, he wrote a really, really good review article of this. So there's a lot of data out there that would suggest that it's probably not a great idea to use opioids in sensitization phenomena like CRPS. And prevention, you know, this, this is probably something we should really be thinking about, but since trauma causes CRPS, meaning fractures or even planned surgeries, is it possible that you can use uh, uh, things like vitamin C to prevent the development of CRPS uh, post-surgical? Uh, and the answer is absolutely. Um, Zollinger, uh, who's eh, another uh, Dutch guy, um, had done really, really beautiful, elegant experiments suggesting that uh, high-dose vitamin C preoperatively can prevent uh, the development of CRPS, which gets us right back to that sort of anti-inflammatory, um, uh, uh, antioxidant view of the world in terms of not only what causes the disease, uh, but what maintains the disease and I put all my patients on vitamin C. Um, How much? About 500 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams. Even if they have chronic? Correct. There's no evidence at all. But see, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy that it really doesn't do any harm at all. It's cheap. <coughs> Why not? I don't like to give them a lot more than that because then I'll be dealing with, uh, you know, ulcers and belly problems from the acid. All right, interventional pain management. I will defer to my colleague, Philip, to talk about this. But, but the way that the, the, the Malibu conference and the treatment guidelines that I had written uh, deal with this is you start with the minimally invasive stuff, and then you go to the more invasive, and then you go to the you know, kind of really experimental stuff, the very logical approach. We feel that this is a complement to that uh, rehabilitation interdisciplinary team approach. I don't think that... that a real interdisciplinary team uh, without, a, um, uh, without an anesthesiologist can be effective. Somebody needs to do the blocks, particularly in CRPS. So there's certainly a role for this. It may not be the first thing you do or even the 20th thing that you do, uh, but certainly you need to have that expertise in, on your team. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, just to go back again to biometric objective measurement of what happens when you do a block. This is what happens when you do a block to a CRPS patient. The brain changes, the brain function changes. Uh, and this patient uh, would relate that their pain went down as these changes, these functional changes in the brain occurred. Uh, Antrothecal baclofen, uh, they're using this very, very frequently in, in Holland to treat dystonia. Makes sense, but it improves the pain. Uh, Intravenous ketamine, again, Philip's going to talk a little bit about this. The high-dose um, uh, coma approach uh, doesn't fly. It doesn't fly in my book. It doesn't fly in anybody's book in the United States. The only uh, ketamine coma now is, is conducted in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It was conducted for a while in Germany, but they had, a, uh, they had one, really just one bad outcome. Uh, and they shut it down. So now you can't get it done in Germany either. Uh, I believe in terms of a risk-benefit analysis, it is way too risky. And there's one death that I, I know of for sure, and there's possibly a second death. So it's simply the risk-benefit ratio is just, it's just not right for the high-dose ketamine. Now, on the other hand, the low-dose ketamine is, is actually quite promising. This works at the uh, you know, NMDA receptor, and we'll hear, hear more about that. Spinal cord stimulators, one randomized control trial. It was a very poor trial, but it showed that it worked. But then when uh, young Dr. Kimmler looked back at six months and one year, it, was no, it didn't work, continue working. You know, this may be cost-benefit ratio, uh, but it doesn't look like it's working all that well. Um, I hope nobody's highly offended in the room. I don't care. Uh, but, 
So a spinal cord stimulator doesn't work all that well, and implanted pumps don't work at all, and there is not a shred of evidence that supports implanted pumps. All right? Surgical therapy, sympathectomy, risk benefit. Oh my God. So you don't like what the sympathetic nervous system is doing, so you whack it out. If it offends thee, pluck it out. <laughs> Nobody was really helped by this in the long run. Some people got short-term relief, but then, as you can imagine, they had receptor upregulation. And then they were right back where they started, and worse, because now their anatomy was, was considerably altered. All right. Well, I probably said enough. I can, I can see that I'm making some enemies in the room, so I'll run right out the side door and let <laughs> Philip take all the flack. But uh, we'll have questions at the end, I think. Can you hear me? Mic one? Yes, in the back, good. Well, first let me thank Dr. Harden, who, by the way, we've never met until an hour ago. And I tell you that for the following reason. Dr. Harden is a researcher by his own admission. I am more of a clinician. Um, and so you're going to get two very different views of certain things today. Um, they will become very apparent as we go along, so I'm not going to tell you in advance. Um, but let me begin by this. I am an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Neurology at Hahnemann University Hospital in Philadelphia. I am not a neurologist. I am in that department because of my work with what I will probably be calling reflex sympathetic dystrophy today because I can't get out of the old way. So you'll hear CRPS and you'll see RSD. So let me make this disclaimer. I understand the difference between them. I just kind of get used to doing it this way. So if you hear me see, say RSD, CRPS, accept it as one and the same. People ask me, how did I, as a general practitioner, because that's what I am, I'm a family doc, how did a general practitioner get started seeing patients with complex regional pain syndrome? In 1993 or 1994, I had a patient who was in an automobile accident and came into my office and he did all the right things. We did x-rays, we did CAT scans, we did physical therapy, we did everything we were supposed to do, and she not only did not get better, she got worse. So as a family practitioner, I did what I was supposed to do. I referred her out. I referred her to orthopedics, I referred her to neurology, I referred her to neurosurgery, I referred her to rheumatology, I referred her to infectious disease and probably some other places that I'm not remembering. And after six months and $100,000, I absolutely positively knew what was not wrong with this woman. I had no clue what was wrong with this woman. So on a Saturday, I went to a local library, medical school library. There was no internet, so I had rolls of dimes. Those of you old enough to remember the dimes in the photocopy machines. And I started pulling out books, and I had tables full of books. And I went through about seven hours, and at the end of that, I came back the following day, and about two hours into it, I saw the term causalgia, and bells and whistles went off. I figured maybe it was because I'd been there too long. Uh, but the bells and whistles went off, and at that point in time, I began to get the concept of what was causalgia reflex sympathetic dystrophy. So I took it back to the office, and I said to this woman, I know what's wrong with you. I know what we're going to do. And I was really, really happy. So I called the orthopedic surgeon and the neurologist, and, and I told them all, but they didn't believe it. And I then found two other patients in my practice who had the disease. And at that point in time, it became like the commercial that said, I told two friends who told two friends who told two friends. And last week, I had 900 patients with this disease that I have seen since that time. And so what I'm going to give you today is my experience, some of which is, is reference, some of which is in my head, and some of which may ultimately be in writing, of seeing 900 people and the things that I have learned, having seen 900 people. So the reason that I, and, and it's interesting, Dr. Harden mentions the psychology. I'm, I'm an undergraduate psych major. Little did I know back those years ago how it was going to be so important in what I was doing with patients. I'm also a mystery buff, which is what sent me on this path to the, to the medical library. And I'm a Sherlock Holmes fanatic. And it is true, life it is infinitely stranger than anything that the mind of man can create. So 
We're going to talk today about start to finish. The patient comes into the office, you take a history, you do a physical examination, you do diagnostic tools, you treat the patient, and you get the patient better. How do we do that? Well, to me, the history is absolutely, positively the most important thing. And I can't stress enough that you've got to set aside time to look at the patient, listen to the patient, smell the patient, know what is going on with this individual. Case in point, man walks into my office, hand contracted in front of his chest. I walk into the room, I know that this man's been in an automobile accident, his left arm is this way, and in my mind I'm going, okay, how did he stretch his brachial plexus and get his reflex sympathetic dystrophy? Because I already know that's what's wrong. Now I gotta figure out how it happened. So how did it happen? I was in a car accident, I was the front seat passenger, I had the, the seat belt come across me, and the guy wasn't, that was driving wasn't gonna stop, he rear-ended the guy in front of me. Okay, and, well that's it. No, that's not it. <laughs> what else happened? Well, I went forward and went back. Okay, so maybe he messed up his cervical plexus, but I need more, and so time and time again I repeated this until he finally told me, oh yeah, by the way, my nephew was in the back seat, and I was afraid he was gonna get hurt, so I reached back to hold him. <laughs> now all of a sudden the mechanism of injury is different. Mm -hmm. The concept is different because the questions brought the answer to, to bear. This is what I need to know because now the light's on and now I know where I'm going. Physical examination, observation before examination. Dr. Harden was talking about EMGs. I'm going to tell you that if you walk into a patient with complex regional pain syndrome and start by putting your hands on that patient, you've lost a friend and made an enemy. Because that person is gonna shut down. They are not gonna to talk to you. They're gonna sit there and cry. They're gonna be guarding. They're gonna be difficult. So to me, everything happens before I touch the affected limb if it's only one limb. Because you're going to hurt the person. So I apologize. Hey, I know I'm going to hurt you. I'm sorry. I'll try not to hurt you too much. But I need to do this. And it's amazing because now you've got a friend. You've got somebody who says, okay, I understand that you understand and I'll do the best I can to help you help me. Okay. So because there is some overlap between what Dr. Harden said and what I said, let me just talk to you about a couple of these things. This is a differential diagnosis going through my head, is going through the head of, of others, and you are looking at some of these which overlap, but some of these which have the potential to be a causative etiology or a, a second problem that we're dealing with. You can have two things. You can be hypertensive and have diabetes. You can have complex regional pain syndrome and something else. So these are the things. You know, you have somebody who's all swollen, and so you say, well, does this person have lymphedema? Or are they swollen because of the complex regional pain syndrome? And the answer is maybe it's both. So these are the differential diagnosis. Now, I said to you that we're going to have a difference of opinion. This came from the fibromyalgia website. And, and I want to read it to you because I want you to hear certain words. The pain of fibromyalgia is profound, chronic, and widespread. It can migrate to all parts of the body and vary in intensity. The word stabbing, shooting, deep muscular aching, throbbing, twitching, numbness, tingling, burning. These are words that I, I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Aggravating factors, weather, sleep, physical and mental fatigue, excessive physical activity, inactivity, anxiety and stress, and more. Irritable bowel and bladder, headaches and migraines, restless leg syndrome, periodic movement disorder, etc., etc., etc. And again, this came from the National Fibromyalgia website. This brings me to this. I don't believe that fibromyalgia is a separate entity from complex regional pain syndrome. I believe fibromyalgia is complex regional pain syndrome. Now, this is one of those differences among individuals. You can't put 10 doctors in a room and get them to agree on anything. So my opinion, and that's why it's in capitalized, is that fibromyalgia is complex regional pain syndrome. I just read you what the Fibromyalgia Society says, and I'm telling you that that's my typical patient. So either I'm treating a whole lot of people with fibromyalgia, or I'm treating a whole lot of people with complex regional pain syndrome. I think it's the latter. And there are actually these two articles in the, in the literature of people who agree with me. Now, again, that's two articles in, you know, the world literature, but it's an opinion that this disease entity, look, we understand that both diseases are mediated in inflammation. 
In fact, virtually all disease, if not all disease, is mediated inflammation. So it really is not that much of a stretch to say that there are a great number of similarities. And maybe there are some differences, and I'm certain that there are. But if you operate on the premise that these are one in the same disease, it takes that five million number that Dr. Harden offered and makes it 50. And now we've got all these people out there who come in, and I can't tell you the number of people when I take a history. Any medical problems? Yeah, somebody told me five years ago I had fibromyalgia. My mother has fibromyalgia. Somebody told me they thought I had fibromyalgia. Take it for, again, my opinion for, for what it's worth. So let's talk about incidence, incidence of CRPS. 41.8 years, mean age at time of injury, 37.7. Mean duration of symptoms, 30 months. More frequent in females. Usually involves a single limb in early stage, and we'll get to spread in a minute. My youngest case that, I've ever, that I ever saw of RSD was eight. The oldest was 88. Um, and the younger people, the eight, 10, 12, 14 year olds that I have seen throughout my history of seeing these patients invariably do a lot better for reasons that I will tell you. One of which is that they're younger and they heal better. Another of which is they don't know enough to worry about it. So they just get better because they wanna go out and play. And we'll come back to that in a bit. Again, the numbers that I, that I gave you before, one to 10 million, depending upon who you hear from, from the associations and the statistics, fivefold if, the, if you incorporate the, the uh, fibromyalgia patients into that. Now, spread. Another thing, I believe in spread. This is not to suggest that I'm right and Dr. Harden is wrong or that Dr. Harden's statistics are in, in, incorrect, but I almost never see a patient who has one limb disease. I'm thrilled when I see a patient with one limb disease, but invariably, by the time I see a patient with this disease, they've been to six doctors. They've got a stack this big of medical <coughs> records. Uh, I, I, it, just as an anecdote, I, I had a woman come into my office one time and, and she stacked up records. Each stack was about that big, and they were in five nice and equal stacks. And I said, what are those? And she said, well, that's doctor one, doctor two, doctor three, doctor four, and doctor five. I said, let's talk and let me examine you and then I'll go back and read the one, two, three, four, and five. So I'm sitting in front of her having had this conversation and, and, and she's in, I'm on a stool and I have my little percussion hammer and she had problems mostly in her arms, very little problem in her legs. So I was comfortable hitting her with the percussion hammer in the legs and I went to hit her and all of a sudden there was a drop of water on her thigh and her pant leg. I looked up at the ceiling, I thought we had a leak. Okay. No, nothing there, so I went back to hitting her. Now there's a second drop of water. Then I looked at her, and it was like Two-Face in Batman. One side of her face was profusely sweating and dripping water on her pant leg, and the other was bone dry. So I took the five things, and I piled them up into one. I said, okay, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to go ahead with the disease. But the problem is that most times when I see people, and they have gone to doctor and gone to doctors and gone to doctors and gone to doctors, at that juncture, the original limb, the original site of injury may or may not still be symptomatic, but whatever followed it is invariably worse. And so my job is really to do time-lapse photography in reverse. You know, to have, you know, it, we throw the pebble in the pond, the time-lapse has it come out of the pond. We need to do time-lapse in reverse. And so there was one paper in the entire medical literature written by my colleague, Dr. Schwartzman, in 2001, who said that spread can occur up to eight years and 95% of the time it will go left arm, right arm, or left, le right, left arm, left leg, and 5% 20, yeah, of the time on a diagonal. Um, again, I see it all the time, and whether it is, as I theorize, complex regional pain syndrome, a centralized disease spreading, or whether it's a fibromyalgia type response as Dr. Harden offered, is up to you, my opinion. So, diagnostic-wise, X-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, bone scans, and I'll come back to that in a minute, discograms, myelograms, arthrograms, all anatomic studies, all studies that look at the anatomy, and for all practical purposes, basically worthless as a diagnostic tool for what is complex regional pain syndrome. It is fine for what isn't wrong with the patient. Triple phase bone scans were, for a great deal of time, thought to be the gold standard for the diagnostic testing of 
complex regional pain syndrome. Now, I have two problems with this. One, you're sticking a needle in the arm of a patient that has complex regional pain syndrome, which already is not a real good idea. Secondly, 20% of the people statistically had positive scans. Now, I deal in the real world. The real world is run by the insurance companies. So if I'm doing a test that has a 20% statistical probability of showing me an answer, that means it has an 80% statistical probability of not showing me the answer. I don't like putting bullets in their gun because they're going to say, here's the bone scan. Bone scan's normal. Your diagnosis can't be right. I don't need that. I don't need to have a diagnostic test that is risk-provoking and inaccurate. So I don't use them. But the rest of these tests have their places depending upon the history and physical examination. EMGs, which Dr. Hard mentioned, are, if you've ever had one, you're running in the other direction if you don't have this disease. If you have this disease, you're not even letting us talk about this because this is a, a nasty test in somebody who is hypersensitive or allodynic. Somatis and by the way, it's a motor function study in a sensory disease. This is a sensory disorder. So you're going to get an EMG, which may or may not be positive for motor study, and a sensory disease. And I will tell you, time after time after time, people who have EMGs and a brachial plexus injury, I get the EMG back and it says they've got carpal tunnel syndrome. They don't have carpal tunnel syndrome. They have a brachial plexus injury that looks like carpal tunnel syndrome, electrodiagnostically. And worse, some of these people have surgery on their non-carpal tunnel syndrome, which makes their brachial plexus injury wild, crazy bad. So I stay away from EMGs. Evoke potential testing is nice, but really gives you very little information. QST, quantitative sensory testing, and autonomic sensory testing is fine if you can find a machine. There are very few. And also, um, the statistics and the research is, is minuscule at best. Which brings me to thermographic testing, which for me is the only diagnostic test that any patient should ever have to make the diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome. Now, I say this wearing the hat of a thermographer. In 1972, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare validated thermography for these reasons. And so thermography, which is infrared imaging, which I will show you in a minute, has been around, at least as far as they're concerned, since the 1970s. Now, I will tell you the history of thermography briefly. In the 1940s, the government used it for military purposes. In the 1950s, the government was using it for medical reasons. In the late 1950s, it was released, but nobody really did much with it until the 1960s, when people started to experiment with infrared imaging. In the 1960s, we were using cameras, they were using cameras that were driven by different modalities. By the 1970s, they were using liquid nitrogen to drive the cameras, and by the 1980s, they were still using liquid nitrogen. It really wasn't until the 1990s that we got into the way of finding out how we could use thermographic testing without sort of archaic means. And now in, in, in the 21st century, it's all really high-tech automated. The nice thing about it is, A, it's a sensory test. B, it's non-contact. C, it's non-invasive. And D, I have never, never done a thermogram on a patient that was suspected to have complex regional pain syndrome that the thermogram didn't show me exactly what I expected to see. Now, you can sit there and say, well, there's bias because you're seeing the patient, you're reading the study. No, I'm also reading studies in patients that's, that were sent to me. Never seen it be wrong because it is so supremely sensitive and easy to do that it really should be a stable of every clinician's office who is diagnosing and treating complex regional pain syndrome. There are those who will tell you, well, the government says it didn't do this. In 1982, the government said thermography can be a useful adjunct in the diagnosis in many areas, including musculoskeletal injuries. So that goes out the window. And these, and, and I apologize that, that really what should have been lighter is darker. Um, but this is one of the indications for thermography, and you see that I'm still calling it uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. So what, what happens? When you do a thermogram, you're doing it on a patient that has hypothermia because of vasoconstriction and nerve atrophy and nerve dysfunction and sympathetic stimulation. So 
all the things that are inherent in this disease are those things that the thermographic camera will pick up. After six months, you see cold. Before six months, you see warm. And the explanation really is based upon the fact that infrared imaging images the function of the nervous system and chronic pain conditions for the simple reason that it's looking at the blood vessels which create patterns that lend themselves to do exactly what we need them to do, diagnose a disease that is otherwise undiagnosable by conventional anatomic testing. So because we have excessive vasoconstriction of blood vessels that cause the cold hands and feet that talk about all the time, and, and the neurovascular changes, we can now get pictures that will give us the answer as to what's wrong with the patient that you suspect has the disorder, but you need confirmation. So validation of thermography and the diagnosis of, of reflex sympathetic dystrophy is based upon the um, references seen below. And these are just two of many, many studies that have been done worldwide. I can tell you that the world of physicians believes that thermography has a place in the diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome. It's really only in this country that we have not established that, but we're working at that. Right? So let me give you a, hit, a, a case. A 43-year-old female, an airline passenger wearing sandals, is in the landing process and cuts her foot on a piece of wire or metal, she wasn't sure which, that was sticking up from the plane. She complained of foot and ankle pain and a squishy feeling. She had two and a half years later left facial pain, left ear pain, left uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle pain, left cervical spine pain, left elbow and hand pain, abdominal pain, left-sided, thoracolumbar spine pain, left breast pain, photophobia, constipation, and irregular menses. All the things that you see here, left, 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 and, and up at the top, I really should have said she cut her left foot. And so what happens is she comes into the office and we do thermographic testing. Now, most of you have never seen a thermogram before and I'm going to show you the beauty of this. This is the left, this is the left leg. And what I'm doing here is I'm basically measuring the temperature in the right leg and comparing it to the left at different points. And in doing so, I'm getting temperature gradients in centigrade degrees. Now I can tell you that the normal human body is symmetrical within reason. It is symmetrical up to, we have learned statistically, nine-tenths of one degree in neuromuscular studies. So when you have an individual who in this particular case in, in, the, in the anterior shin, in the calf, is a 1.6 degree temperature differential, there's got to be a reason. Because this is not vascular. If it was vascular, it would be vascular distal to it as well. This is not vascular. This is a lady that has a complex regional pain syndrome thermographically diagnosed. And so the same lady, okay, in the inside of the foot, in the outside of the calf, and if you go back and you look, I mean, here's, here's the, the, the calf, and here it is again, same area, same lady. Temperature differentials in varying places that allow you to know that what we're talking about is accurate. Not only that, but these are her hands. And you see the temperature differential in her hands. Again, the entirety of the left hand is colder than the right. And the numbers, not in the fingers, but the rest of the numbers are 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. In all cases, the left side is colder than the right. Why? Because she's got sympathetic dysfunction. And now I'm measuring her sympathetic dysfunction. OK. Case number two, a 40-year-old female sitting on the third row of a football stadium at a charity event. I need to give you a little history here. They have these charity events for professional teams, and what happens is that some of the players will throw a ball up into the stands, and they're supposed to throw the ball back. In this particular instance, the kicker kicked the ball up into the stands, so it went much higher. And it got into the hands of a guy who decided that he was ready for prime time. He was going to play in the NFL. And he was going to throw the ball back onto the field. Well, unfortunately, he was a little too far away. And so he threw the ball, but it never quite made the field. It made the third row of the stands where this lady got hit in the hand with the football. Now, somebody said to me, how can this possibly, it broke her hand. He said, how can this lady possibly have complex regional pain syndrome from a football that hit her on the hand? And they said two things. If you're sitting there and this football is coming at you with whatever the speed of a football is plus the force of gravity and it's coming at your face, 
you're probably not saying, okay, this football is coming at my face and I'm going to let it hit me. You're probably putting your hand up and you're probably keeping it in front of your face. And when that football gets close, you're probably trying to push the football out of the way because you don't want to get hurt. We, as human beings, protect our face at all costs, which is what happened to her. Well, this is what happened to her hands. And what happened to her hands is to the tune of 1.9, 2.2, and 2.5 degrees. Now, she's got a contracted, swollen, blue hand, and, and she's got all those hallmark symptoms that we come to associate with CRPS patients. But if somebody says to me, prove it, okay. So I now have a diagnostic criteria that validates my history and physical examination and my working diagnosis, the other side of her hand. And this is her left arm as opposed to the right. So uh, for my money and for my way of thinking, if you're sitting down with a patient and you have the, the question, does this patient have CRPS? Are we dealing with, with, with this? And you need validation or in a medical legal case, and let's face it, a lot of these are injury cases, they're workman's compensation cases, they're motor vehicle cases. You need objective evidence of injury. That's what it's about. Lawyers, if there's a lawyer in the room, they will tell you objective evidence of injury. I have objective evidence of injury. I have something that anybody in this room can see, assuming you're not colorblind, and I can show you where the issues are, and this patient walks up and says, I've got this cold blue hand, and I've got the pictures to match it. Two things happen. Number one, you now have validated to the insurance industry who's paying the bills the fact that you have a working diagnosis and objective medical evidence. And two, you've turned on a light bulb for the patient who's been before the doctors who say, I don't have any idea what's the matter with you, or I can't treat you anymore because I treated you for what I thought was wrong with you and it isn't that. Or in this particular case, the orthopedic surgeon who said, I fixed the fracture, I'm done. Which is okay because he or she is done because the fracture is healed. So I now have the ability to show this to a patient and say, I know what's wrong with you, I can prove it. Okay, moving on. People have this concept that pain is pain, and it's not. There's all different kind of pains. And when you talk about analgesic medications or treatment for pain, you have to know what kind of pain you're dealing with. Not all pain responds. A lady who walks into my office with migraines is not going to have pain relief with Percocet like she's going to have with Butalbital. It's just a fact of life. One Butalbital is better than five Percocet because it's focused and directed at the pain. This disease has at least four pains. Muscular pain, inflammatory joint pain, deep bone pain, and burning, and, and burning to be different from the inflammatory. The burning pain is the reason that we are using, well, let me go forward, okay? The, the burning pain is the reason that we're using neuropathic agents. We're using the neurontins and the lyricas and things like that. The deep bone pain is the classic hallmark RSD pain. Somebody stabbed me in the shin with a knife. It's into my bone. It, nothing takes this pain away. It's deep into my bone. I don't know how else to describe it. Well, you did a pretty good job. I understand. Muscular pain, we all understand. Inflammatory joint pain, we all understand. And so what I try to do if I'm using medication to treat a patient is I treat the muscle pain with muscle medicine, the inflammatory pain with inflammatory medicine, the headache pain with headache medicine, if that's the direction that I'm going. And I don't just simply write a pain medicine prescription and assume it's going to work in all four cases. Because it's not. You're doomed. It's not going to work. Okay, let's talk about treatment as Dr. Hardin did. Physical and occupational therapy. Uh, I'm gonna, let me do it this way. Um, it says gluten-free diet, and, and I really wanna just take a minute and talk to you about something that we did. Um, I have holistic health counselors that work with me in the office, and they basically sit down and talk about what to eat and what not to eat. I have an infusion nurse uh, who works along with them in addition to doing my ketamine infusions. And we have discovered through their efforts that people who go to a gluten-free diet get pain relief in days. Days. Now, I will tell you a quick story. I had a woman who was on methadone for quite a long time for pain, and she was wonderfully controlled on the drug until the cardiologist decided that she didn't need methadone anymore because it was messing with her electrocardiographic QT intervals. And I could not control her pain in any other way. So she wound up in the hospital with intractable nausea and vomiting. And in the hospital, they endoscoped her, they gastroscoped her, and found out that after the biopsy, she had celiac disease, which was of no great surprise to any of us. 
and we put her on a gluten-free diet and sent her home with the option of coming and getting ketamine. I sent her home on a Sunday to come in on Tuesday and get ketamine. She called my office on Monday to tell me that she didn't need the ketamine on Tuesday because she was already beginning to feel better one day into gluten-free. Now, gluten is a high inflammatory substance. This is a high inflammatory disease. So we are trying to get the patients to go gluten-free. I mean like the Bible, gluten-free, do not eat. And what I found is that within days, these people are better. And if they decide this weekend to go out and have a pizza, they get worse. And so they come back next week and say, you know, I was really doing good until that garlic and pepperoni pizza tore me up. But I'm back on my gluten-free diet and I'm feeling better today. Without any new drugs, without any new treatments, just simply by changing what they eat. So I encourage you to look at gluten-free. Attitude and psychological family support. We have people who talk about their, my RSD is terrible today. It's not yours. It's a disease. Okay. It's RSD. It's not yours. If you adopt it as yours, you, I'm working at a deficit automatically. It's not yours. You don't want it. Give it away. Give it to somebody else. My, my RSD, no. So when I can get people to have the attitude that they are going to beat this, that they are going to do something, they are going to work and, and move on with their lives, that they are going to embrace something, which is why the spirituality is up there, that, that, that they are going to be religious, that they are going to uh, go to work at, at, a, at a volunteer job, that, that they're going to take a yoga class, something to take them away from the 24-7 focus of my RSD, the improvement begins. And it snowballs. Gluten-free, hey, I'm working one day a week in a, as a volunteer capacity, I'm going to, to church on a regular basis, I'm volunteering with this one, and all of a sudden you begin to see that nothing else that I'm doing is changing, but they're now taking an active role in their own well-being. And they have adopted an attitude that I'm not going to let this beat me. This is something that's there, it's a speed bump in my life, I need to move on. And these people do better. This is simple stuff. This is not germane to this disease. I just happen to be talking about this disease today. It's germane to any disease. Diabetes, hypertension, disc disease, pick something. Do what you need to do to get yourself psychologically there and spiritually there and dietarily there. And if you're fortunate to have a support network, great. I had a lady who came home uh, with RSD, she had not one but two neck surgeries and she can do nothing and she gets up every day and she does stuff. She teaches water aerobics and her husband comes home and puts a white glove on to check for dust in the house. I am not making this up. Okay? And if it's dusty and dinner isn't on the table, he's screaming and yelling at her. I told her to shoot him. And if she didn't want to, I offered to do it for her. Because there isn't a, a, a court in the world that's going to convict me. It's justifiable homicide. <laughs> and finally, after four years, she's going to divorce him. I, I applauded. The point is that when you have the psychological support, when I have a husband who brings the wife into the office, and they're sitting, and he's on board with doing this and doing it makes it so much easier. And that's why education, from our perspective, is so important. Medications, injections, infusions, stimulators. Let me say a word about stimulators. This is something Dr. Harden and I agree on, and, and, and intrathecal pumps too. The only time I have ever seen a spinal cord stimulator work in a patient is if they have one limb disease. If somebody comes in and they have one arm, how's the rest of your body? Fine. If I fix that arm, how's the rest? I'm going back to work, driving a truck. I'm fine. Nothing else? Nope. Bout? Nope. Swallowing? Nope. Eyesight? Nope. Just that arm, fix that arm, good to go. If you put a stimulator into that person through a trial and, and an implant, that's the only situation where I have ever seen this work. And to me, it is preferable than pharmacotherapy and a lot of the other things that we're doing. So if somebody comes in and says, I got it in both arms, out of, the, out of the question for me, don't do it. And by the way, if somebody is going to have a spinal cord stimulator implanted, 
the doctor that's doing the implant should have a thermographic camera in the procedure room. I am lobbying with the companies that make stimulators and have been lobbying for years to put a camera in the room. Why? Because the limb is cold. So what we do is we give somebody some sedation, they're half stupid, and you say, does the arm feel better? And they look at you like, I don't even know if I got an arm. <laughs> don't, why are you asking them? Put a camera in the room and watch the color change from blue to pink. Put them to sleep. They can't seem to grasp this concept, but I keep coming back to them and, and, and suggesting it. Intrathecal pumps, to me, have the following place. If everything else in the world has failed, and you don't have another idea, and you've read the entire world's literature, and nobody in Greece or Germany has an idea, okay, and you want to save their stomach because they're ulcerated from all the medicine they're taking, then maybe you should consider putting a pump in because it'll go into the pump and not directly into the stomach. And, and when you mention pumps to people, that's the way I do it. And it's okay, well, I'm not there yet because I say, you know what, it, it, there's always something else that we can try, okay? I really don't want to go in that direction, all right? So we talked about a, a diet and lifestyle, anti-inflammatories, uh, alternative therapies. My wife is a Reiki master. I will tell you, we did an interesting uh, one patient. Patient came in with complex regional pain syndrome. I took a thermographic set of pictures. She did a Reiki session. Next week, we repeated it. We changed nothing else. And in six weeks, that individual went from an asymmetric thermogram with the affected side being cold and the other side being warm. Six weeks later, it was almost a mirror image one side to the other as a result of the Reiki sessions and no other changes. One patient. The, there will be more, I'm sorry? I have like four or five one limb RSD patients and they come in every six weeks. I get Reiki? Healing touch. I took one level Reiki, but I do heal and it works. Well, now we have six patients. <laughs> um, what is it? Reiki, Reiki is, Reiki is, is uh, uh, oriental uh, energy healing. It's a, it's a gentle touch or a non-touch. Uh, the Reiki master works in the energy field of the individual, getting positivity of the energy to try and correct the underlying problems. And then do it on the opposite side of the injury. Because if you do it on the injury side, you can increase their pain. But if you do it on the opposite side, especially if you do touch, it works. Great, I appreciate that. Hyperbaric oxygen is, um, the, the, for me, the next step. Um, I, I, there is virtually nothing in the world literature that discusses the use of hyperbaric oxygen in complex regional pain syndrome. There are two anecdotal articles in all the research that I could find and a very small number of people. But let's think about this. If you hyperoxygenate the blood, won't the body attempt to do what it was made to do, which is heal itself? And so I have a company that I think is going to work with me and we're going to do a, a blinded study using thermographic imaging and hyperbarics to determine the effectiveness of hyperbaric on complex regional pain syndrome. And maybe a year from now, I'll be able to have statistical evidence to support my theory. This is my theory, um, but I really do believe that we're going to find that hyperbaric has a place in this, in this um, treatment. Uh, vitamins and nutraceuticals, B12 and intrinsic factor work very well for me. You heard Dr. Arden talk about vitamin C. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about medications, but I'm sure that some of you are not familiar with some of these. Uh, Pemidronate is, is a uh, rheumatoid arthritic drug uh, from France um, that Paula Abdul allegedly took for her complex regional pain syndrome. Lenalidomide is a thalidomide drug, uh, and, and those of you who are old enough to remember the horrors of thalidomide in the 60s, um, it's back, uh, but it's back in controlled studies and in, in some very uh, selective individuals that has had some success with the treatment of complex regional pain syndrome. Mixilatine is, is lidocaine um, in its oral form, and I have found it to be a drug that either works or doesn't. And what I mean by that is it either works and they say, why didn't you give this to me sooner? It doesn't do anything. Uh, they need cardiac clearance to make sure that, that there's no cardiac issues for the mixilatine. DMSO, Dr. Harden mentioned, um, topical DMSO burns. And, and it's, you gotta be real careful with that. Amantadine is actually a, a, uh, an anti-flu drug. 
Naltrexone is an interesting drug. Low-dose naltrexone is, is really becoming more and more in vogue because you can use this opioid antagonist in doses of like a milligram to a milligram and a half once or twice a day. It has almost no side effects. It's cheap to buy. It has to be compounded in that dosage. But in places where this is being used and the reports that are being issued, pain is being very, very well controlled on this class three drug. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of research, but really right now it's one of those things that I think is on the horizons. Antidepressants have never been a favorite of mine in the treatment of this disease, despite the fact that everybody's depressed. Um, the problem with the tricyclics uh, is that they put weight on women, and I defy you if you're a male clinician to walk in and say this one, I'm going to give you this drug, and it's going to put 15 pounds on you, Mrs. Smith, and she's going to take that prescription and throw it up and throw it in the trash can. <laughs> she's not going to take it. Uh, and I've never really found it worked all that well. Anti-anxiety agents, benzodiazepams, the problems with that is that benzodiazepams, in my opinion, make people more depressed. So now you're giving somebody a drug that's going to make an already depressed person more depressed, which seems a bit illogical. Antispasmodics of the whole gabapentin line, and all of these other things have been muscle relaxants and anti-inflammatory agents we're using for the four pains, calcium channel blockers and antihypertensives. Uh, people experiment with them just to see whether or not they're getting any relief as part of the pharmacotherapy, which brings me to ketamine. Now, I've got a lot of slides here that, that, that I do not really wish to go through and read for you, um, and you're welcome to do that, and when this becomes available uh, for you to get online, all the slides will be there. But let me just give you the, this, the history of ketamine and how it came to be. In 1963, ketamine was used for operating room anesthesia. And for many, many years, it was a very prominent operating room anesthetic, and it worked very well. Had very few side effects. People did very well with ketamine. People woke up from their surgeries and went on with their lives. Except that they found that when you use ketamine for long procedures, open hearts and bypasses, the people were waking up a bit psychotic. <laughs> and so in the normal course of events, new anesthetic agents came along. And ketamine sort of got pushed to the back, and it was really relegated to two uses. One, treating burns in kids in emergency rooms, because the kid's in and gets out very quickly, hit them out, change the burn, they're gone, and they don't really know what happened. And a lot of dentists will continue to use it for oral surgery. In the late 1990s, researchers in the country of Australia happened upon the fact that ketamine worked for the pain of complex regional pain syndrome. So they gave these patients intravenous ketamine and adjunctive drugs, and they found out that the people got better. And so they gave them more ketamine, and they got better. And they gave them more ketamine, and they got better. And they gave them more ketamine, and they got psychotic. <laughs> so, so they reached a point where they said, OK, we're going to have this sub-anesthetic dose of ketamine, and we're going to use this for uh, CRPS. And, and an American uh, researcher uh, by the name of Harbit was responsible with two Australians, whose name I don't remember, uh, for writing the very first paper, which got published in 1999. And from there, it came east. Uh, to Philadelphia where Dr. Schwartzman and I in 2004 began treating patients with the awake ketamine. Now, what that means is that we are giving people ketamine in a dose that allows them to wake up and function. If you get ketamine and your bladder gets full, you get up, like if you had taken a sleeping pill, and you stand up a bit wobbly, I grant you, and you walk to the bathroom. Right? If there's a loud noise in the room, you wake up. So the awake dosage or the, or the sub-anesthetic dose is really almost like taking a sleeping pill. What's the side effect of ketamine? It makes you tired. Okay? So these people sleep in the infusion suite. And they sometimes need adjunctive drugs. They need something for headaches, sometimes something for anxiety, sometimes something for uh, nausea. And so we do whatever we need to do to make people more comfortable while they are being infused to ketamine in the suite. And I'm just going to change this if you want to read about this stuff. So what we have learned is that if you give people ketamine, they get better. Well, what does that mean? Well, 80 or 85 percent of the people that I have treated in, in my office, and that's about 120 people, so it's not just a couple, are better. Better means they do more and they take less medicine. That's better. Some go back to work. Some actually are able to have a life. And if you've got this disease, if I tell you that you can get up and get in the car and go to the movies and have dinner, that's something you haven't been able to do. That's a big thing. Now, I do not believe that ketamine is the beginning and the end of treatment for complex regional pain syndrome. 
I believe it is a treatment. I believe right now it is about the best one we have for refractory CRPS. Somebody gets injured six weeks ago, I'm not giving them ketamine. I'm doing all the things that Dr. Hart talked about. We're going through the stepwise way. We're doing blocks and occupational therapy and physical therapy and we're changing their diet and we're doing all the other things. But when I see them four years later, and you know, they're walking with assistive devices and coming in with crutches and they have all this pain and the list of drugs is this long. It works. It works to make them better enough to do other things. To do physical therapy, to do occupational therapy, to do counseling, to do diet changes, to do all the other things. And I see this, again, this is all my opinion, I, I see this as a means to an end because I still think there's more stuff. I think the hyperbarics have something to do with it. I think diet has a whole bunch of stuff to do with it. I think there's many, many things that come into play. I think multifaceted is a good word, but multifaceted is not only all the people involved, it's all the treatments involved. Because you can't make somebody better by giving them ketamine and sending them home. Because what happens is, two weeks later or two months later, they need more. Mm -hmm. And this is the downside to ketamine. People need boosters. They need to go in incrementally and get enough ketamine intravenously to keep their blood level up. Because if they don't, they go back to where they were. And that's a problem. Because it means that they're sort of tethered to you intravenously for the long run until we come up with something else. And so what we're trying to do is come up with the something else, which in conjunction with the ketamine, will allow us to get them to that place. You know, kind of take the ski lift and get them to the top of the hill, and then they can get on and go on their own way down. And we've had people that have gotten to the point through all the things that I've talked about where they don't come anymore. They just go about their lives. <coughs> so my statistic, my statistic, non-published, is 80 to 85%. That's pretty darn good. And if I can get them to wrap their head around the fact that it's not their RSD, they're going to do well. So I'm going to, to just... I, we talked about, I talked about all this. Ketamine comes IV, oral, intranasal, and, and topically. We're using intravenous. Oral ketamine has, has a couple of problems. One, um, it, it's, you gotta keep taking, you gotta keep taking a lot. There's, there's a high incidence of street use of oral ketamine. And because of that, you gotta be careful as clinicians who you're prescribing it to, because Big Brother is always watching. And if you're, if you're ordering ketamine, that's number one. So the only time I use this is if I have somebody whose recalls, whose boosters are at a finite time, let's say six weeks, and for five weeks they do really well, but that six weeks, a little rough for them, I may supplement the intravenous with the oral. But that's pretty much the only time I do. The intranasal uh, becomes very addictive. I mean, people are constantly sticking this pump in the nose and squirting the ketamine in, and while it works, it has been found in a couple of, of preliminary studies to have a high correlation with, neuro, with uh, neurogenic bladders and interstitial cystitis, and I mean bad interstitial cystitis. Mm -hmm. So, and topically, compound pharmacies all over the place are using ketamine in the compounding with seven or eight or nine other things, and that's great if you have somebody that has a finite area. Okay? As I said to, to somebody last night, you can't fill the bathtub with the ketamine treatment and get in because your whole body hurts. It's just illogical. Okay, so as Dr. Harden mentioned, the anesthetic dose of ketamine is very different. Anesthetic dose of ketamine is five days in a drug-induced coma with fantastically high doses of ketamine. Um, I have sent two people of my practice, uh, actually they both went to Germany, um, I have sent two people. Um, both of those people came back symptom-free. I mean, totally and completely, we thought, cured and both of them actually relapsed to some degree. The one death that Dr. Hardin talked about was in Mexico, it was a 21-year-old girl who had congenital heart disease, and she had been to Germany, had the anesthetic dose, got better by a really strange quirk of events, re-injured herself, and decided that it was worth it to her to risk her life to try the ketamine again in Mexico. Came out of the ketamine coma symptom-free, and two days later developed an irregular heart rhythm, went into right heart failure and died at 20, 20, 21 or 22. Um, Germany closed down because um, uh, they were doing reasonably well and a woman from Philadelphia or the Philadelphia South Jersey area went over there and had a successful ketamine infusion um, 
and then got medically ill beyond that. Um, uh, she, uh, she got a massive overwhelming infection that the Germans, who are very, very far advanced medically, for some reason were not able to, to deal with. And they thought she was going to die and they airlifted her back to Philadelphia. And ultimately, they were able to correct the underlying infection and she went home. But at that point in the, the time, the Germans said, nine, you know, we're not doing this anymore. And they, and they shut down. So uh, right now it's in Monterey. Um, and, you know, this is, th this is the paper that Dr. Schwartzman and the, and the two German guys uh, wrote in terms of the anesthetic dose and the sub-anesthetic dose. Uh, three years ago, there were, eight years ago, there were three places. Dr. Harbert was in Arkansas. Dr. Schwartzman's in Philadelphia. I'm in New Jersey. And today, as we speak, there's over 60 places uh, and more as it goes along because it has become widespread accepted. Um, this is the second study. Uh, this, I'm sorry, this is the first study that Dr. Harbert wrote. Uh, Dr. Carell was one of the uh, Australians that I referenced. And, and so we, we base our patient selection on the old IASP criteria. And pretty much to summarize it, anybody who is, has failed at other more conventional treatments, we consider as a ketamine potential candidate. And we do that with the understanding that a lot goes into this. We have a psychologist to evaluate them. We have a cardiologist to evaluate them. I now have a dietitian, or, or my holistic health counselor more accurately, put them on a gluten-free diet. This is my doing, the new, the new things that we're doing. But the cardiology is etched in stone, the psychology is. And I explain to people that if you are depressed, it's not a reason that we exclude you. If you're schizophrenic or bipolar, we do. Um, but we actually have only kept one person out in all the years I've been doing this. Cardiologically, we've kept a few out. Uh, and it says over 18 years of age, but we don't take anybody under 21 for medical legal reasons. Um, and then uh, I talked about this with the boosters, and this is the outpatient article that Dr. Schwartzman wrote, and another that Dr. Goldberg and Schwartzman wrote at Cooper. And as I said, 80 to 85% of the people really did get better. Now, this is a paper that Dr. Schwartzman and I wrote and we can't get published, and I was glad that Dr. Harbert said what he said earlier because, I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Harden said, um, because it's going to show you the way the government works. Dr. Schwartzman and I wrote a paper on the use of ketamine intraoperatively, meaning that people that go to surgery, from dental extractions to podiatric surgery and everything in between, we give them ketamine as a course of their anesthesia during the procedure. And I speak directly to the anesthesiologist, and the amount varies from 85 to about 125 milligrams. In my portion of the study, not one person, zero, not one person extended their RSD. Not one. Every single person went in with a degree of disease and came out with the same degree of disease. And those of you who have been studying this disease long enough know that this is not the way it used to be because a surgeon would run from a patient with a diagnosis of CRPS saying, I'm not going to do this because I'm going to spread your disease. Mm -hmm. And so we wrote this paper saying that we studied all these people and nobody spread on my part, and I think two out of 25 on his. The statistics were 90-some percent, and we can't get it published. Now, you may say, why can you not get this published? Because the government, and it, through, the, through its machinations of the journals, said, because it's not a blinded study. <laughs> now, let me explain to you what this means. Please take half of your patients and send them to the operating room without the ketamine, <laughs> and the other half with. And then if you still have the same statistics, well, wait a minute, folks. I'm not going to send somebody to the operating room without ketamine and let them spread the disease when I know I can prevent the spread of the disease by giving them the ketamine. We're not interested in your paper. So it's not anywhere that you'll find it until somebody is willing to recognize the stupidity of wanting a blinded study in a situation like this where we have a statistically significant uh, number of people. There was this one article here, and it took just a couple of people in 2005. I think this was a German study, if I remember correctly. So uh, earlier, doc Dr. Harden talked about difficult cases. I want to talk more about atypical. There's no such thing as a case of RSD that's easy. Uh, or, or mild. Headaches, uh, very quickly, headaches, which are often called migraines, are rarely migraines. They're usually greater occipital nerve headaches or muscle contraction headaches. 
Uh, you treat them for migraines, they don't get better. You block their greater occipital nerves, they will love you forever. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I, I do my greater occipital nerve blocks with homeopathic agents and it works better than uh, lidocaine and, and, and uh, cortisone. What do you use? I, I, use, I use products from a company called Heal. I'm not a paid uh, spokesperson for Heal, but I use Tromiel and Zeal from the company called Heal, and I put about a half a cc of B12 into it, and I'm getting about six months relief. And I'm not an anesthesiologist, I'm just doing occipital blocks and getting wonderful, wonderful results. Um, you get this kind of cardiac irregularity, which uh, is, is a bit of a problem. Yeah. I have. Um, <laughs> this is a 45 year old female who had a syncopal attack. There's a surprise, huh? Um, and uh, we put a pacemaker into her. I have nine patients that have pacemakers that have complex regional pain syndrome and not one has diagnosed heart disease. Not one. Okay. The sympathetic dysfunction is slowing the heart to a bradycardic rate and causing this, uh, this kind of bradycardia, which um, necessitates the implantation of a um, pacemaker. Atypical chest pain, people that come in with go, go through the entire car cardiac workup, negative, 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 negative. Find out there's atypical chest pain from the disease. Um, photophobia, otophobia, vibration. People tell you they're driving in a car and the car next to them has a, a real loud cranked up stereo system and their pain gets worse through walls of buildings. It, transient hoarseness comes from the, the disease affecting the branchial, not brachial, branchial plexus. And, and it is not necessarily an immune compromise, but frequently comes from that irritation. GI. I could probably spend a half hour talking to you about GI effects of nausea, vomiting, and most especially delayed gastric emptying. Uh, patients with this disease have delayed gastric emptying, they have delayed gastric emptying studies, and they throw up. And, and you give them anti-nauseants and this and that and the next thing, you give them Reglan, nothing works. And if you put Botox endoscopically into the, into the uh, pelvic sphincter, it will relax the sphincter and it will help the, the delayed gastric emptying. And again, you're not going to find this in the literature because nobody wrote it. We've had great success with, with, uh, with Botox into the pyloric sphincter. I've had two patients who needed surgery um, uh, to correct the problem. And the most amazing part about it is in all the 900, I've had two people that we couldn't stop this with, and they're sisters. Um, a, a pancreatitis. I see elevated amylase and lipase in non-drinkers, non-traumatic, non-diabetics. Again, this is just something that I'm seeing. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, urinary incontinence, dysuria, or inability and difficulty voiding. I'm told that these people have interstitial cystitis. My own belief is that they have neurogenic bladders. If you correct the underlying CRPS mechanism, you make them better and their bladder gets better. If you put them into a hospital and put an epidural catheter in their back and infuse bupivacaine for five days for the treatment of their lower body, complex regional pain syndrome, their neurogenic bladder basically disappears for a finite period of time until that procedure wears off. So that's the bottom part of this. Uh, gynecologic polymenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea. Um, here's another one. If you, if, if you get patients in their third trimester of pregnancy, all the symptoms of, of CRPS go away. They just go away. People come in, how do you feel? I'm fine. I had a woman came in one day and she said, I'm pregnant. I said, how, how, that's great. How long have you been pregnant? She said, three days. I said, how do you know she had how many symptoms? So I have no pain. I don't even have a positive pregnancy test yet. I know that it's gone. All my pain went away yesterday. It's the only one I've ever seen like that. But in the third trimester, third trimester of pregnancy, it goes away. It comes back. But most often it doesn't come back as bad as it did when it went away. And interestingly enough, women who breastfeed prolong the return. I had a woman breastfed for four years because she just didn't want the symptoms to come back. Syncope, autonomic dysregulation. Uh, this, is, this is from an, an article called Syncope, Syncope and Complex Regional Pain Syndrome in Clinical Cardiology, real small down there at the bottom. But syncope is very common in complex regional pain syndrome. I, I will give you this, a 44-year-old female with long-standing history of CRPS in a motor vehicle accident accelerates the symptoms. She re-injures her brachial plexus and has classic CRPS and begins to have drop attacks. Now, we went through a work, a brain MRI, EEG, laboratory testing, carotid ultrasound. Everything was negative. <coughs> and I put her in a soft cervical collar. 
You say, well, wait a minute. You put her in a soft cervical color for vertigo. Explain that to me. I have no idea what inspired me other than God to do this. But she would walk around like this with one shoulder up to protect the plexus. And so I'm, I'm, I'm watching her walk along and fall down. And so what I did was we took her to, to x-ray and I had them do a carotid ultrasound bilaterally, which was normal. And then I had them rotate her head one way and the other way. Well, the problem was because she was raising up the shoulder, she was partially occluding her left carotid. So when she turned her head to the right, there was not enough flow coming up the impaired carotid, and down she went. So I put her in a collar, which in essence stopped her from turning her head to the right side, and she doesn't fall down anymore. And as we have been able to treat the plexus injury and the arm has dropped down, we can take the collar away because the vascular flow has been measured to be enough. Things you fall into. Cognitive dysfunction, uh, you know, we hear all the time, my memory is gone. I can't remember my social security number. I can't remember my mother's phone number. And part of this is the drugs, and part of this is the <coughs> disease, but a lot of this is the isolation. You're not working anymore. You're not going out with your friends anymore. You're staying at home. What are you doing? I'm watching television. Okay, so you're brain dead. Really, what are you doing? How are you making your brain work? You gotta use it or you lose it. And so I get to you know, tell people, do things to make your brain work. If you're gonna watch TV, watch Jeopardy. At least you're playing the game and it forces your brain to think. Do crossword puzzles, pick up the phone and call people and talk about politics or something that forces you to think. And maybe do research, maybe read an article in the newspaper to talk about. Because you get brain lazy. I made that term up. Okay, okay. Lastly, I think, genetics. I have a 37-year-old female casino worker who was struck by a money cart. They used to have money in carts in casinos, not paper. And this guy had a money cart and he was coming down a slope and lost control of the cart and it rammed into the side of her thigh. And she wound up developing CRPS in that limb that migrated to the left arm. And one year later, almost to the day, her sister, two years younger, who's a police officer, was broadsided. The door handle hit the same part of the same thigh and she developed CRPS in the same leg which migrated to the same arm. Now, if this were the only case, I would say this was anecdotal. I've got 14 families where more than one individual has this disease. There is absolutely, in my mind, a genetic predispos predisposition to this disease. I don't know what it is, but it's there. Okay. Anxiety and, and depression, chronic pain leads to depression. Depression begets anxiety. And that's why I said earlier that, that benzodiazepines wor worsen depression. Multiple sclerosis, I have eight patients that have both diseases, and if you can get the MS under control, the RSD gets better. Eight. All female, by the way. Okay. So, as, as I started with Sherlock Holmes. I end with Sherlock Holmes because, as I said, I'm a fanatic. Um, and I always end every one of my presentations with this because I think that a lot of what we do in terms of history and physical examination is the rule out. Anybody in here who's a clinician understands that in your brain you're ruling out. I know what it isn't, therefore I will come to the conclusion of what it is. Um, and so in essence, we're basically eliminating. I mean, that's what we're doing. Uh, and, and, and so Conan Doyle wrote this, but for me, take a history, do a physical examination, be open-minded to all the things that may in some way, shape, or form give you signs and symptoms that go along with this disease. And don't eliminate anything saying, I didn't read that, because I know you saw stuff here you never read. Okay, be open-minded with it, get people better, and let's just move forward together and do what we can do. Thank you very much.